Thank you for being here. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the ECS one twenty five watt amplifier today, and everything we say about this amplifier will also apply to the Silent Night equivalent of the uh, EVS one twenty five watt. Uh, for the Silent Night, EVS stands for um, Emergency Voice System. ECS is Emergency, I think, Control System. I don't know why they had to make them different, but they did. Other than that, they work the same way. They have the same options, the same number of circuits, all the same specs that we're going to get into talking about today. So anything I say about this Fahrenheit panel, the same is true for the, the Silent Night equivalent. So I'll start off with a couple of the uh, other things I've done as we've talked about these panels. One is there's obviously not conduit here. On a job site, there needs to be conduit. This is just a temporary mock-up. Um, another thing you'll notice, I don't put service loops in the panels. It is important to make sure you have a service loop. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that why as we get through where some of these wires come through. You can see there's a lot of wires coming in this panel because this is a 125 watt amplifier. That's at its full capacity. We normally uh, derate our ratings of, our, of all amplifiers by a, a safety factor of 20% you know, duration or only 80% capacity. In this case, that's exactly 100 watts. So we try not to exceed 100 watts on any of our design so that there is some of that safety headroom put in. The, the amplifier doesn't end up cooking itself or doing something to damage itself in the event of operation. Uh, this part right up here, this metal part, and then there's a metal bracket that comes up and attaches into the back box there. That's actually a heat sink because these panels do generate a lot of heat under just normal operation. So they, they put a lot of a cooling into this and the door even has a, a vents that go across the top up here that'll also help that heat escape. Um, up here in the top corner, as it's been with all of our others, this is where the building power connects to it to, to power it. And then this bottom corner down here, this is where the batteries will connect. Last week we talked about series and parallel circuits and I showed you some examples of wiring bat batteries in fire alarm systems. So that'll, that comes from here and it'll go down and the batteries will sit below all of this down here in the in this cabinet. This cabinet can hold eight amp hour batteries or 18 amp hour batteries inside of it. The 12 amp hours are shorter and fatter so they don't the door won't actually close right with the 12 amp hours in it. And if we run into an, uh, into an application where we need something larger than 18 amp hours, then we would have to put conduit out of the bottom of this. We'd still come off this battery charger but we'd go down and we'd have something like 26 amp hours in a cabinet below. All right, so to get into some of the different terminal placements, down here we have our four main speaker circuits on the ECS-125 motherboard. This side over here is the ECS-125 motherboard. This side over here is an optional expander. It's the ECS, what is it called? EC, ECS-CE4, it's a circuit expander for it. it adds four circuits to it. It does not increase the wattage capacity of what the panel can put out. It just allows us to attach more circuits if we have the headroom for it. So this is an optional expander card over here. And this is the main unit itself here. And like I said, down here, you have your four circuits. So this one over here, it's one, two, three, four. It goes from right to left, but you have an out and you have an in, then an out and an in, out, in, out, in, all the way across. Those are for class A returns. We always land our speaker circuit on the out if we're doing class B with the end line resistor supervision, because you have to think about it from the, the originating point of the source. So the amplifier is the source of the, the power going out to the speakers. So it's gonna come out of the amplifier, go to the speakers and end at the end line. If it is class A, then the return circuit from the end of your circuit would come into the end, and then it just needs to make a complete loop. Um, moving along up right here, this connector, I have most of it tucked behind, but there's this ribbon right here. It just goes in here and it's a loop that connects up to here. This is how the CE4 connects to your motherboard here, or your amplifier card, I should say. This comes with your CE4 expander and you'll just connect one to the pins here and the other there. There's no programming or addressing or anything special to tell it that there's a CE4. Uh, that might be wrong. There might be programming. I'll have to go look, I don't recall. But there's no addressing. There's no other special physical installation requirements. The amplifier is addressed right here on this block. This, this is your dip switches here. 
and uh, and then you just connect this and that's all it takes to put the CE4 in. And then we have these screw terminals up here. You have these four terminals down here. This is your S bus. Wires up the same as the other S bus that we've talked about with the negative, the positive, the A and the B. And then you have four terminals up here. This is your V bus in and out. Now I'm gonna push these wires off to the side because you can kind of see. Then I've got two yellow wires coming for my V bus because it just takes a 16 two. All V bus is is low level audio. It's, uh, it takes the origin point that's at the, the main panel and it goes through any microphones first, then it comes to the amplifiers. And so all it's doing is it's carrying your voice messages, whether that's a pre-recorded message or something you're paging over the microphone, it takes that message and it brings it to your amplifiers. And so it comes in on your V-Bus in and goes out to the next amplifier and your V-Bus out. If it is the last amplifier in line, these terminals here, trying to keep my arms out of the way, these terminals here would be where your 15K end of line resistor go for your V-Bus. And then coming in over here, you see we have, um, we have four additional circuits. So this is circuit five, six, seven, and eight, starting in the top left corner and then counting our way around clockwise. So again, this card does not add any power. If this card is in, we still only have 125 watts. If this card is out, we still have 125 watts. This is helpful because it gives us some extra zones to, to distribute to. And then it's also helpful because we can get some of our decibel loss on our speaker circuits off because we can we can run shorter circuits, which keep all the speakers performing better. If your speaker circuit gets too long towards the end of it, you'll start getting uh, some slight signal loss on it. Your power just goes down with more distance and more devices on it. And so it might not necessarily exceed the 100 watts that this amplifier is capable of, but it might exceed what the wire and the circuits are actually capable of carrying out to the field because we'll, we'll have some inefficiency there that signal is lost even though nothing's using the power. So expanding and adding extra circuits will help with that. Uh, it, it would also help in high-rise situations. Each of these circuits can be programmed individually. So if you wanted, you could program first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, you know, have each circuit correspond to a different floor. Or you could have, you know, pairs of circuits. You can say, oh, I need two speaker circuits on this floor, but only one on another floor. Because we can individually control all eight, that makes it very uh, versatile, very easy to use that way. Or if you're in a school building, which is where we use most of these panels, and you're like, hey, this speaker circuit hits this whole wing of the building over here, and that's all it does. Whereas this one hits like my cafeteria and gym, we can put descriptions on the circuit. So if there's ever problems with it, it'll tell us speaker circuit and cafeteria and gym has a fault or an open circuit or a ground fault or whatever. So it has all those capabilities, just like the NAC circuits we've talked about. We can describe what the NAC circuits are. We can say what they do in a description that shows up on the panel if there's ever a problem with it. Where this is different than those S bus power supplies, those power supplies have those flex put options where each circuit can be an input or an output. That is not the case with the amplifiers. The amplifiers are only output circuits and they only do speakers. They don't do auxiliary power. They don't do door holders or any of those other things. It's just a speaker output. Um, another thing to note with these silent night power or um, silent night amplifiers, the larger 125 watt amplifier that we use a lot only puts out the 25 volt audio signal. On the back of your system sensor speakers that we put in, there's a, a knob that you can select between 25 volt and 70 volt. If you're working and your job has any 125 watt amplifiers, whether it's the EVS 125 or the ECS 125 for silent night or Fahrenheit, then you can just automatically know it has to be 25 volt because the amplifier is only capable of the 25 volt. It is not capable of the 70 volt. If you have smaller amplifiers because they make a ECS and an EVS 50 watt. The same thing is a similar cabinet. We can still even put the CE4s on it so we can expand and have four or eight circuits on those as well. Those are capable of 25 or 70 uh, that's handled in the panel programming. And so just make sure you coordinate with whoever's coming out to program your job site. Make sure you tell them what you installed your speakers as because you, if you installed all your speakers as 70 volt, but your amplifier gets programmed as 25 volt, then we're not pushing enough force out to those speakers and they're gonna to be too quiet. And then the opposite is true as well. If you install all your speakers as 25 volt 
and then the programmer selects 70 volt and sends all 70 volt out to your job site, then we're going to be overdriving the speakers and your, your clarity and your intelligibility won't be right because there'll be too much force and you'll get distortion in your speakers. So we need to make sure whatever we have programmed coming out of the panel is also what we're installing in the field. And if you have these 125 watt amplifiers, which most of like the schools that we do, we use the, the 125s instead of the 50s because we can get a lot more out of them. Then we have to use the 25 volt selection. Oh, I said I was going to talk more about the um, service loops. I don't like to put service loops inside of panels. Uh, one of the things you're able to see a second ago, whenever I moved the circuit over, you can see how it makes these clearer to see, easier to work with. And I have these kind of grouped together with their zip ties. And then these up here are kind of together. And then the ones on this card, I actually don't even have zip ties on because the wires are pretty short and they stay in place by themselves. With this many wires in a panel, if I had service loops in here, it would make it even messier and more difficult to deal with if I had to come back and troubleshoot or I was on a service call or doing anything else. However, with some of these circuits being so close up to where the wire's coming in, this one right here, for instance, only has that much wire between the knockout and the terminals themselves. And the circuit beside it, so circuit five and circuit six are very similar in that respect. There's not a lot of wire there to work with. So we need to make sure we have some extra wire somewhere in case something goes wrong, or if we need to swap a panel out or we need to do some troubleshooting and that's just not enough wire to get to what we need to do. Having a service loop up above the panel will make that easy enough to work with, but it'll also keep the inside of the panel neater. Right here, I have eight speaker circuits, two V bus circuits and one S bus circuit. So that's 11 different uh, cables coming down here. And then it's possible to have even more S bus circuits because the S bus can be T tapped. So we could have two or three S bus circuits coming into this panel. And then we're talking 12, 13 cables coming down through our conduit here. And that's just a lot to work with. And then if you have all your uh, service loops inside of here, it just makes even more wire be in the way. So doing it this way, you can see it keeps it fairly clean. We've got nice, neat 90 degree angles. You can follow where everything's going. You can work on it. You open this up, wires aren't jumping out at you. It doesn't look unprofessional, but we can also still get to everything we need. And we still have a service loop up above the panel. I've kind of just mentioned this, but when we're installing panels, we do need to make sure they look nice, neat, and professional. We want to see, you know, the 90 degree angles coming up. We want, if a customer or like a, a school maintenance guy or something opens a panel, if wires are jumping out at him and it looks like somebody that doesn't know what they're doing is wiring it up, they're going to complain to their boss. It's going to be harder for us to get more jobs. It goes all down the line and it looks, it just looks bad on our company. It looks bad on each of us. And this didn't take too long to wire it up this way at all. Starting from scratch with no panel hanging on the wall to the time I had it done took me about 30 to 40 minutes. I think that'd be comparable to if say the electricians had your, your back box mounted and your conduit put in, but you had to mount your circuit boards and drop your wires down. I think the work that I did here today would be very comparable to if your home runs were already done and all your conduit was already finished and you're just having to push your wires down your conduit, mount your circuit boards and then land all the wires. I think 30 to 40 minutes is uh, very reasonable for getting this done. And as you can see, this doesn't look terrible. Now there are people that can do even better than I've done, you know, good for them, but I'm not gonna worry about doing much better than this. I think this is good enough right here. So if you can get your panels to look rather nice and neat, you open it up, you can trace where the wires go. You can clearly see that these go up this way and you're not having to worry about snaking around everything in the world. Now these, you can see I snaked around a little bit, but it's, it's clear and it's nice and neat. And then like this wire right here is actually, I'm gonna try to pull it out here so I can show you just how much spare wire there was. So you see it's rather big and leaving it out would make it kind of messy and jump out at you and just getting in the way. So I tucked it inside back here, just behind the circuit board. Cause I don't need all that wire. It's just going from here to here. They give you a lot of wire to make that small jump. So you can see it looks a whole lot better once I just tuck that in there. So doing little things like that to make it look better is a, is a really important part of installing the panel because they need everything we do needs to look and actually be professional and done correctly. As far as all the wiring goes, 
every single one of these terminals is well labeled on the circuit board itself. It's printed well. And so you can quickly tell, okay, this is my output for my speaker circuit. Here's negative, here's positive, so on and so forth. So I think that's about all I've got here. If y'all have any, any questions, um, I'm open for questions. Make sure you sign in in the chat feature for our safety talk sign in. And uh, I'll hang out for a few minutes for questions. And then after that, y'all are free to go.